All right, can you hear me okay? So, um, very nice to be here. Uh, quite amazing venue uh, for this conference. I'm actually son of a preacher, but I've never preached in a church myself, so this is the first time. And, and today the topic was, is the gospel of IT for IT. Uh, before we go into that, uh, just brief introductions you know, on the agenda. And then I will tell five stories about applying IT for IT in practice. And then also some lessons learned uh, from those stories and, and some future prospects, how we see that um, what could happen in the future uh, in this domain. So brief introduction to myself. I started in IT as a web developer, uh, but then got into IT service management at Wärtsilä, a global company based in Finland. Um, where I was working in the, in the IT department and, and we were moving towards more mature IT service management and towards SIAM uh, frame, framework. Uh, so that was a customer environment, uh, but then uh, after that was completed, I moved to managed service provider, Tieto, uh, the largest MSP in the Nordic countries, and we did the same thing uh, to enable the SIAM, uh, but from the service provider point of view. And, and nowadays then working at Sofigate as a, as a consultant. And Sofigate is the leading business technology company uh, in the Nordics, and today the focus is on business technology. Just a brief background why we talk about business technology. Uh, there's been good talk about that already, but um, when we meet with the CEO of a company and we have one minute to discuss with him or her, uh, we ask him, how do you manage technology in your organization? And they start telling that, yeah, we, we do it very well. We have the CTO managing the technology that is in the core of our business. Then we have the CIO, uh, she's uh, focusing on the old school IT and making it run efficiently. And then we have the CDO, uh, he's now focusing on all the fancy stuff and the mobile apps and all these cool things. And, and then we have a uh, chief digital marketing officer who's doing that, this and that. And while they are ex explaining this model, they actually start realizing that no, we are not really managing the technology. We have silos here and there who do something about technology, but there's no common management framework around it. And that's what, where we aim to help now with this business technology uh, concept that um, you should actually have one common way of managing business technology. And there's plenty of things, because Sophie Gates' background is in the, in the IT, as a as a, IT management as a service and sort of IT service management largely. Uh, we see that from there there's plenty of good practices that could be used more widely now that uh, IT is becoming part of everything. And we see that this is the golden era uh, for IT service management. Uh, there are two mega trends. Everything as a service is turning, well, everything into a service. And obviously that requires service management. But at the same time, the digitalization means that IT is becoming part of everything. And these together obviously uh, lead to the fact that these practices we have in IT service management become much more relevant than they have been maybe in the past. So how, do you, how did we get here? Uh, we have tried to picture this in three eras. Uh, first, maybe in the 90s or, or early 2000s, we were in the ITSM era where we were focusing on ticketing and help desks and, and maybe the first uh, ITSM tools were implemented back then, but it was quite reactive and based on the contacts from the users. And then from there, for example, what I was involved at Wärtsilä, we moved towards this service management uh, where service became the centerpiece of everything. Um, we, uh, by defining the services that we provided to the business, actually we got the context for a lot of processes. We knew what these incidents were about, we knew what these changes were about, and we could manage the services um, according to maybe ITIL version 3 at that point, but also implementing then uh, more mature IT service management tools, publishing the services through catalogs, uh, enabling self-service, etc. And here we built a lot of really good structures, uh, important structures uh, for good service management. Um, and in some cases, maybe even too strong structures or too rigid structures in that sense that the customer experience and user experience were forgotten. We were strictly forcing users to know that this is an incident, this is a service request, and we were educating them about it. And now, how do we see the future, um, the, the next 
third era or, or something that might be coming, we see that um, there could be two options maybe even. Uh, we might go into more and more structured, like IT for IT, I think, is an example of excellent structure for managing the business of IT. But on the other hand, we have technologies coming up which may be reduce the need for this kind of structure. We have things like the robotic process automation, where actually a robot can do things that humans do, used to do, and we don't need a good tool, we don't need good APIs if we have a robot doing the, the clicking. Or then chatbots, I will give an example later on, but I think in general chatbots turn unstructured human talk or, or human writing into structured actions. And that's maybe removing some of the need for this uh, more structured uh, architecture. But I, I think it's not still uh, saying that, uh, that we wouldn't need this kind of reference architecture. So I think that's really the basis and, and you will be seeing that. Uh, for the third era where we go towards the highly automated uh, service management. So my brief history uh, at Wärtsilä when we were implementing the SIEM and ITSM and, and, and ServiceNow was a tool there, um, we did it based on the idle guidance and we read all the thick books and um, tried to understand what was the best practice and then based on that configured the tool and defined the processes and, and uh, educated the people. And uh, during that time, we had a challenge that there's 26 processes and nobody, nobody can list them by heart, or at least people could not learn it, and it was way too complicated. So we decided to define end-to-end -end processes. Uh, we defined four of them, um, and we gave them certain names, and, and then they were combining the different ITIL processes. And I was, we were almost completed with the project when then I first read from the internet about IT for IT <laughs> and realized that actually somebody has done this already much better than we did. And a uh, lot of the same ideas there, uh, but uh, defined much better. And then when I moved to Tieto, uh, we decided from the first day that uh, we will use IT for IT as the basis uh, of redesigning the architects of, of managing IT services. And, and that's what, what we did there, and implemented basically all the tooling and all the processes based on the IT for IT. And the most common question I, I back then got, and, and still I get when I talk about this, is that, okay, uh, will this now replace the ITIL? I'm not sure if that's a question because they would like to have something replacing ITIL, or if they are afraid of their certifications uh, that they have paid for. But, um, but that's the question anyway, and I, I never, I always say that no, it's not really replacing it. It's a different viewpoint, it has different strong areas, but certainly there are uh, new ideas out of IT for IT that you should leverage and, and you should use uh, to benefit the business. But what I also always tell at the same time that, well, if you run an ITIL project, do you not start IT for IT project? Uh, that's certainly not needed. Start the projects that your business needs and then use IT for IT in those um, as an inspiration and as a guidance, um, just as you should have done with the ITIL also. But it's not something that you decide to uh, implement. Uh, you should really have some business targets that you aim for. So um, then one more question I often get is that, well, why do we at all need a reference architecture for, for the business of IT? And uh, that's when I usually tell them that, well, uh, think about the construction industry. I've been involved there because I, I built a house a couple of years ago and saw how the construction industry works. And it's, it's an old industry, much older than we are in IT, so there's something that is quite mature there. And uh, when I bought the piece of land, uh, I got this kind of a diagram showing the piece of land, and there are some, si there's hardly any text in it. Um, there's some signs uh, that even I can understand the, the size of the land and maybe some positioning and uh, some other information. It's very high level, but when I gave it to an architect, uh, the architect designed more details on it building on top of it, not um, really removing much, but uh, adding more signs and, and uh, numbers. And here there's already some information I might not understand, but the professionals in this industry fully understand. And then when I gave this architecture design to an engineer, they uh, designed the air ventilation and, and water pipes and all, all that. And they used their own 
reference architectures, they know that these two pipes work together. Uh, you can connect them easily, and they use the notation that they understand. So think about, in this kind of context, giving uh, to the construction men um, five thick idle books. This is the best practice for building a house. Read them, go to the courses, get yourself certified, and, and do it. Uh, I don't think that would be a success story. And similarly, in the, in the IT, I think uh, this kind of reference architecture, it's, it's much more valuable in project context, where you don't have time to start reading the books, but you simply need to start executing. Uh, that's when you need reference architecture, some very thinking done by someone smart, and uh, then you can build on top of it and use, the, for example, the, the um, science and, and the kind of syntax that they have designed. Even to a level that you can then connect it to the IT, like I have then uh, Alexa in the house commanding, or I can command all the, all the systems almost uh, through the Alexa, so it, it even connects to the IT world. So that's about the introductions uh, to the topic, then the five stories, and now I must warn you that this is what I'm presenting now as the five stories of applying IT for IT. This is not IT for IT, uh, the terms that you will, you, you will see, and uh, also kind of the theory. Uh, I'm not saying that it's strictly IT for IT. Uh, it's how we have used that as an inspiration and as guidance in these projects. And it all starts from the user experience. I think what has been very important in IT for IT is that there's this brokering model. So the users should have one interface, one common user experience uh, of, of the IT services. Whether they want to use the mobile app or service portal or APIs uh, for, let's say, ordering something, uh, still it should be consistent user experience uh, underneath. They should not need to jump to the portal of that vendor and then to the portal of that vendor and then to the intranet for that, for that need, but somebody should be brokering it. And that's why we have often called it service management and orchestration layer that you should have in between. Uh, this is kind of the request rationalization. So if we think uh, employee onboarding as an example, uh, there's a new employee, uh, the manager goes to the service portal and, and submits some information, selects the devices and the access rights they need. Uh, it should be really orchestrated with the workflow uh, that then integrates the different suppliers and internal uh, service providers uh, to the chain and, and then user has consistent experience, they have one ticket to follow, uh, they, know they don't need to jump between the different providers. But not only that, uh, this could be easily done even by having a good instruction for how the tickets should flow between different parties. Uh, it's really important that the workflow then handles uh, the subscription. Does this user even have right to do that or have these services? Uh, do they get the approval um, for all those services? And, and what is the SLA, the, the delivery times for those things that they have ordered? And when the delivery is done, then updating the CMDB, the asset management, chargeback and, and showback uh, information in the systems, uh, that's often forgotten, but when it's built into this workflow running in this service management and orchestration layer, then it gets done automatically. So this kind of picture we have often designed, and I think it's fully aligned with IT for IT thinking there, that there's this request rationalization and there's the uh, request execution or, or fulfillment at the supplier side. Uh, but by separating these two and making sure that the uh, orchestration is consistent, then we can provide a really good user experience and we can actually control that. That quite easily leads us to the second example, the, the Siam example. Uh, so if that was request to fulfill, uh, let's take an example from the detect to correct uh, value stream. And um, here, what has been a very typical implementation that I still see in many organizations in, in the service desks is that there's a, a ticket, let's call it, uh, incident or, or interaction or something, but anyway, uh, it's then bounced back and forth. There's sort of a ping pong between the teams and different vendors, and then you have quite hard time measuring the SLAs uh, by the system, and, and also from user's point of view, it seems like uh, nobody's really wanting to take the ownership of it. So what we have used now as a best practice uh, in these SIAM uh, implementations especially is that then you actually have the second layer. You have the customer interface layer, uh, let's call it now an interaction there, that service desk takes and keeps the ownership from the very beginning till the very end, and that's measured with end-to-end SLA. 
service desk cannot pause it, they cannot have any excuses of not taking the ownership because somebody else is now responsible. Um, and that's related to the customer facing service that also customer understands. And then we have the service provider layer beneath that. And that interaction might then require getting uh, one or more incidents fixed at different service providers that provide these factory services that might be capacity or database management, application management. And those are measured separately with the operation level agreements or underpinning contracts. And, and this has enabled us to very, uh, um, very well measure uh, the different service providers um, and their delivery times and their service levels. Um, separately from the service desk. And it's, it's not only a data model, it's really a shift in the mindset that service desk takes the end-to-end -end ownership, but it's, we've seen it quite impossible to do without this kind of data model, um, because uh, it's so easy to, to build these exceptions into the process. The third example, um, this is a typical architecture uh, concern or discussion and that actually got into almost a fight uh, at the architecture board uh, where there were different opinions on, on how we should implement the self-healing and we had um, different run books or, or workflows or this kind of automation scripts and um, event management tool had one and then incident management needed uh, something as well and, and, and even we were talking that maybe problem management should also trigger certain run books at some point of the process and um, none of the tools that we were using in that context really had this out of the box. So we had to customize them. And what really resolved that architecture concern was then uh, IT for IT picture that we took and looked at and uh, how does it define and it, it really defines only one runbook library that should be common uh, for all these processes and, and that was used as the argument to get that concern resolved and, and get the have something uh, that, well, made sense, but once somebody has written it and it's actually part of a reference architecture, then it's much easier to, much more easy to, to argue and um, get it done also accordingly. DevOps, uh, a buzzword that um, doesn't necessarily always tell that much what, what, what is needed or what is meant by that. And, uh, I've been often told that, well, it's, it's not really about tools, it's, or, or not even so much about processes, it's a culture change. But if the culture change doesn't result in anything, anything tangible, uh, then it, it's not really uh, of that great value. And um, from IT for IT, um, I think great benefit is the connecting the, the operations and the development into one big picture. It was really interesting to hear that in the, at Oracle you have actually forgotten the problem management completely and, and use defect management for that purpose. Uh, that, that might be a really good idea, uh, but in this context that we were working, we had problem management done by the operations tool, people in the operations tool, or ITSM tool, and then the defect backlogs were in another tool, or many tools actually. Uh, so from IT for IT, uh, the guidance to, to integrate these two actually, or at, at least so that we get the problems visible for the development, we get them to the backlog of the of the development teams, that was really valuable. And that helped us to concretize that what could be one way to do this uh, feedback loop um, between the dev and the ops. Next step might be that, the, as, especially if they are within the same tool, that uh, you actually have just one backlog of problems and defects uh, in the system. Okay, uh, final example. and. A little bit of background for this example. So I don't know how many of you work with chatbots or virtual agents. Or are they on the agenda in your organizations? Some of you have them on the agenda. I, I think it's at least coming to almost everyone's agenda uh, right now. And we've been studying what is actually inside this kind of virtual agent. And uh, there's usually you need to define the utterances or the, the phrases that it recognizes, like I would need a new laptop. And then there's natural language processing that understands the phrase and turns it into an intent or links it to an intent uh, that might be, for example, order laptop. And that intent then has certain prompts or questions configured uh, related to that, that when, when you start that intent, you need to ask the following questions to get more details. And then you might be showing 
uh, four options of different laptops, for example. There might be a question after another. Uh, but then at the end, uh, you save those uh, responses to a slot, or some systems call them variables, and then you can start the fulfillment. Uh, this is actually a very good structure, even for when we think about um, not just that the human is chatting to a robot, but even systems talking to, other, to another system. Um, there, there's this fascinating idea that in the future, why don't the systems talk basic English uh, with each other. If we can have this NLP, natural language processing, in between, the systems could be configured to integrate with simple Eng with English and, and not any XML or, or such uh, structured language. Uh, in any case, uh, at the end of this kind of virtual agent discussion, uh, the virtual agent says that, great, after the approval from your manager, one standard laptop will be arriving at your default location in three business days. Now, how do you build this kind of virtual agent? How does the agent know what is the approval process? What is the delivery time uh, for that laptop? What is the location of this user? No chatbot actually uh, has this kind of information, or at least it would be quite difficult to, to build all that in. It really needs a service management platform um, and um, some architecture on that platform underneath. So if we continue with a kind of similar example of a chatbot, uh, when then the user contacts the, the chatbot um, about my order for a MacBook, uh, to be able to provide a relevant discussion with the user, uh, the chatbot should recognize that a MacBook is a product, and actually for this specific user, there's an asset out of that product model created. It was delivered to him or her with this request, and they can check the status of that request, and they can communicate back to the user that, uh, well, yes, this request uh, for MacBook Air is actually completed. How can we help you with that? So it, it's already relevant for the user. And then the user replies that, yes, I have received it, but it's broken. And that's when the virtual agent or chatbot should recognize that it's actually an incident in this case. A uh, user didn't need to tell whether it's a service request or incident, uh, but we are understanding the context, and we say that, uh, sorry to hear that, I have registered incident, this and that for you. And then also we can tell that our on-site engineer will be within, uh, within an hour with you, uh, because we know what is the on-site service provided for that user in that location, and we know the response SLA we have for that location. So we are providing the uh, service uh, time already there. And then we are confirming the default location that this is actually where the user right now is. And once we get that confirmed, then we can, we can close the case from virtual agent's point of view. So without this kind of architecture, information architecture behind a virtual agent, you would not be able to have a relevant discussion like this. But once you have the understanding and the context for this discussion, then you can actually make it a relevant discussion. So some lessons learned uh, from these cases and, and, um, and other cases we've been involved. Um, first of all, I think it's good to understand that IT for IT focuses on these levels one to three. And uh, always in projects, uh, we, for example, at Sofigate, we are working on, um, on the level five mainly. Uh, but we have developed level four, sort of our best practice uh, implementation for uh, IT service management and, and also many other, other use cases. And we have done the then best practice configuration of that on top of ServiceNow and Force.com uh, platforms. Uh, but uh, to have this seamlessly linked, I think that's really something we need to work with um, both at the consultancy houses and, and then together with, for example, Open Group to, to make sure that um, there's a seamless linkage from uh, the standard uh, to the vendor-specific refinement architectures and then naturally to the solution architectures that we build. Uh, but what we have learned, um, I think it's very valuable to train the people with this value chain thinking. That has been much more easy than you would think, uh, because at least the people who have tried to learn ITIL, this is so much easier to remember. Plan, build, deliver, run, four words, and, and you have most of it covered already. Uh, and it's a new perspective also to change the thinking from very siloed processes to value chains that, that works and it's very well aligned with, with the business goals of many organizations. 
but it's not worth setting these ITIL and IT for IT, for example, against each other. It's better to, to build on top of the existing best practices that the organizations have. And often it's easy to start from detect to correct because that's the most familiar part. But then I, I believe that the most value lies in request to fulfill. Uh, and that's the biggest opportunity for a lot of companies. Uh, that's uh, really the value stream of this cloud era and, and kind of consumerization uh, enabled by that. And then when, when we measure processes, uh, it, it's much better to measure the end-to-end -end value streams than the independent processes and, and their execution. Uh, that has had a huge effort in certain cases where, where people have realized that after I've closed this incident, my KPI is still running because uh, I triggered the problem management and now it's pending for a change. So I actually need to get the whole thing fixed um, before I get the KPI uh, measured. And then what we see, uh, and it's coming back to this everything as a service, uh, when we go towards everything as a service and, and we digitalize all these services, it's uh, having a huge potential of, of using IT for IT as a reference architecture there. Uh, so I, I really think you should aim high and aim um, wider than just the uh, enterprise IT. Uh, there's plenty of opportunities in the support functions, but also on the business side. So to summarize the top takeaways uh, from this presentation, I believe digitalization demands much more structured IT service management, and, and there's much, um, th there are technologies that uh, help you there, for example, virtual agents or, or robotic process automation, but it's not going to uh, fix the whole thing. You, you certainly need the structure even behind those. Uh, reference architecture has been especially valuable in multi-vendor discussions. That's what I've seen when we have entered the room with different vendors involved and, and then we have tried to get them to work together. Uh, they all have their own models, but once you can bring something neutral to the table uh, that many of the vendors even have been involved in, in defining, uh, that's much better ground for the discussions. And IT for IT certainly provides very valuable guidance uh, for a lot of these challenges of the, of the modern world. Uh, so certainly can recommend using that in your, in your projects. So thank you for the opportunity of, uh, for presenting here. Might as well sit together and um, get through some of those. Um, one of the first ones that came in, and Rob is just working with me to get some of the other questions up, was uh, near your last slide, which was you s your first, I think it was your first lessons learned. Uh, the question was, um, right out the gates, you said, better train them in value stream and value chain thinking. So do you do that using IT for IT? Thank you. Or do you, uh, and that model and the information that's available there about value chains and value streams, or are you recommending to your clients some other deeper training around value streams and value chain? We've done both. Uh, so finally, we have also these trainings available in Finland. Uh, so we have recommended those. Uh, but then also we have kind of done more, let's say, custom made uh, value chain thinking training and um, starting often from the processes that these organizations already have and trying to put those into a value stream. Uh, that has been really beneficial so, th so that the processes are already familiar now. We are just organizing them into complete chain. Yeah, good. Um, the next question is, you mentioned everything as a service. How do you see organizations managing these services, maintaining lists of services, for example, service portfolio, service catalogs? Yeah, that's where it should start from, from defining these services in, in, in the first place so that you know what you are actually offering. Uh, and even if it might sound like a bit theoretical and a difficult exercise, I think it's certainly worth doing because it provides the context for all of it. And then you can start measuring not just the overall incident management or problem management, but you can start measuring the services and you know where the pain points are. And then you can, of course, revise and, and do it better next time. Uh, but simply defining uh, the services will get you started. Yeah, OK. Um, the 
This one looks like it might have come from a friend of mine. <laughs> Do you think everyone in the IT organization should have a high-level understanding of IT for IT? Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> I, I, do. Uh, I think it provides the big picture, uh, certainly for all the people. Uh, I, I don't think everyone needs to know it to the full level of details. Uh, but um, also today there's been the, the one slider many times shown. I think that's certainly valuable for everyone to know. Yeah, and by that you mean it allows um, you, wherever you work in IT for IT, to understand your position in the value chain? Exactly. And then, yeah, yeah maybe one level deeper, which is what's my immediate upstream and what's my immediate downstream? Yeah. And what's the impact when I do or don't work well with that flow? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, do you think IT for IT is a game changer? For me, it was. Uh, <laughs> when I learned about it, uh, it clarified a lot of things that I had been pondering on and um, resolved some current issues I had back then in, in the project. So um, I, I'm only talking on my, on my own behalf, but for me, it was a game changer in the way that I have designed service management in now in both in customer environments as well as in the service provider environment. Yeah. You also mentioned something at the start of your presentation that I, I, um, that you shared with the audience that I thought was very resonated with a number of customers that I've met over the last four and five years working with this, which is you are already halfway to building your own reference architecture. It was, it was I'm sure, a very laborious process. You weren't done and then you saw this. That is the origin of IT for IT. Several customers had come together at an industry event and were kind of tr sharing notes and the complaint and the challenge and the need to fill this gap and showing their work. And then they realized our individual company is spending all this resource to build this ref arc and yet it's not proprietary. It's, it's not um, a unique competitive advantage. It's just something we all need. And so that was the genesis of this. And so you were, you didn't happen to be in the room that day, but you were yeah. clearly having that same epiphany. Yeah, so absolutely. that's really excellent. Um, let's see. Uh, the next one is, can you elaborate on how or whether you use IT for IT together with Siam? Yeah, we, we certainly use. and. Uh, well, it starts in the SIEM from the fact that you have different service providers doing different processes for to, to manage certain processes, uh, uh, certain, manage certain services, and and then they might be calling different objects with different names. Uh, so once you bring the IT for IT to the table, you have a common map that okay, when you talk with that term, you mean this object, that actually in this integrated process should be linking to this one. Uh, so there you have a common terminology to start with. You start talking about the same things at least. Yeah. And then naturally when you run into discussions that, okay, how, who's responsible for this or what is the interface between this party and this another party uh, in the whole ecosystem, then you have a neutral uh, playbook that you can start from. Um, definition of how it could be done uh, according to the reference architecture, and it's quite difficult to say that no, uh, we will do something totally different. So that has been a good good use case, and all the, also, of course, from tooling point of view, there's plenty of um, data model and these kind of functional components in IT for IT that enable SIEM. Yes, yeah, yeah. Actually, this that question takes us back to part of what Rob was training us on in the end of the uh, of the morning, which is thinking about IT for IT as this very cost-effective umbrella framework that that rationalizes all of these things, SIAM, DevOps, uh, you know, individual other standards and best practices, and you ta sort of tapped into one of the key threads in there, which is that they each come with their own language and vocabulary, but perhaps you would like to have a single umbrella framework for a vocabulary that all could map to. And that way, these different entities and, and individuals and initiatives that are excited and working on their projects with their own vocabulary still flow back in and share a vocabulary. I think it makes the work stream much easier. Hmm. We have another question for you, which is you referred um, to the level of, ref ah, level of reference architecture near the end there. You yeah. were showing, you know, uh, Open Group with our IT for IT standard has provided levels one and two, and you were talking about 
um, that you go deeper as a um, as a vendor in a consulting firm. So it's asking, do you have a level three reference architecture defined, or did o did Open Group provide that? I don't know what is the official answer, but I've seen a draft at least. <laughs> Going to the attribute level, yeah, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess we can share the answer to this question. We're working on that, and there's um, a work a work group right now called interoperability, which is trying to dig deeper because they're kind of part of their end game is they want to be able to get to, to the point where there could be um, IT for IT tool certification. Today, as you know, we have IT for IT foundation people certification, but in order to really help the vendors and help you in driving that interoperability between vendors, we need to get to level three. So that's a work in progress. Um, but then these deeper layers allow the vendors to come in and get more specific, so. Yeah, and, and then it starts to already be on a technology level, and it might be dependent on the platform or, or tool that you use. Uh, so that's where we have then helped our customers to start, whether it's, in our case, it's typically ServiceNow or, or Remedy Force, for example, that how do you then configure that tool uh, to be aligned with IT for IT? Yeah. Um, another question for you is, with the five or so use cases that you shared, um, th there's a curiosity about, do, do you, have those been out and in use long enough for you to have any uh, cost measure, cost savings measures or efficiency measures, any kind of metrics around um, the success of that, those initiatives? Um, all, these were not just from one organization. Um, many of these have been used in, in a number of organizations, so I, I don't think I have any numbers to share, uh, but um, certainly in each of them, uh, they have been successfully implemented, and, and then also from some of them, I have heard that there has been good, good results. The objectives that were set by the business case have realized. Yeah. So an anecdotally so far, yeah. yeah, maybe we'll have you come back next year and Maybe. <laughs> find the hard numbers for us too.